third time's a charm. Ready? Try this again. Yeah. Three, two, one. Welcome to Sounding Point Podcast. This is our fourth interview uh, with an illustrious guest here. Uh, please welcome Evan Kahn, the principal cellist of Opera San Jose, Symphony Silicon Valley, and the uh, associate principal of San Jose Chamber Orchestra. Uh, he's a prolific chamber musician and soloist throughout the United States. And we went to school together at the conservatory in San Francisco and played in a uh, string quartet for several years. So Evan, thank you so much for joining me today. So happy to be here. Um, it's great so to see you, always. I, th I think um, I wanted to ask you on today, particularly because um, everyone's been dealing with this pandemic obviously as they have to we've all sort of been drawing on our inner resources and and dealing with it with it as we must but i think you in particular among all my friends on social media has been really vocal and really um sort of sharing your thoughts and feelings not just about how it's affected you as a professional but also personally and i just want to go into that with you so how how have you been dealing with this, um, and what are some of what are some of the impacts that this pandemic has had on you? Um, well, I started going to therapy. <laughs> um, it's yeah, wow, uh, that's a big question because I mean, all all artists are being really affected right now in a lot of different ways. Um, but we've been in it for quite some time now, you know. And um, I, th I thought that by now, maybe I would have adjusted to some extent, you know, um, but not much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, 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 I value myself in being a fairly flexible person, but um, I, one thing that the pandemic has been really like important for me for is 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 i mean we've had so much more time to think and much more time to be introspective certainly um we're all by ourselves what else do we have to do uh but yeah i i've i, I came to the realization early on right that a lot of what we do is because we feel that we need to like we've, we've spent our our lives honing this craft um, and pulling so much joy and so much passion and so much feeling out of it. And um, the, 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 the joy is such a euphemism. Um, the, the incredible experience it is creating that with others and, and sharing it with others and feeding off of what we get in return uh, is, is something that uh, is akin to a drug, you know? Like, it's really... Um, hard to imagine for a lot of us doing anything else. And um, so we've had to turn to online platforms, you know, mm -hmm. and I think the, I think the, um, the first post I saw that you made about it, you really talked about how um, while you were, were obviously forced to turn to online platforms, you were kind of, it was almost this outcry of saying, of course we're all doing this because we have to, but there's something that we're really missing as musicians that can't be replaced by live audiences. And, and it's really now that we don't have the choice of having live audiences that we feel that absence the most. And so from your perspective, what, like, just so we never take it for granted again, <laughs> and maybe so that when we have it again, we understand really what's it about. What do you think we have? What do you think is irreplaceable about live audiences? Well, I'm, you know, by now I, I should have reread uh, Musicophilia, the Oliver Sacks book. I should have, and I didn't. And uh, Same. so uh, he, I'm sure, explains it in much better, much more scientific terms than I could. However, uh, speaking from solely my own personal experience uh, and my and my own uh, ruminations 
um, there's a tremendous sense of soul, right? Of depth of feeling um, that one can experience when, when you're performing, but also really listening to live music. And um, that depth of feeling can come in many forms, you know? If you're going to see a rock concert, that depth of feeling can come in, in a sense of uh, a surge of adrenaline you might only get when you're skydiving. Mm. Um, if you're um, seeing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, it may come in the form of, of um, tears gushing, but from here, right? Um, these are these are feelings and experiences that that are rare and hard to find, um, and hard to experience collectively. Certainly, um, I was having a conversation through this project that I put together uh, with Sam Weiser and Cynthia Sun called Hidden, uh, Hidden Fabric Music Project. I was I was doing what we call a one on one, um, where um, we uh, I got together with um, someone who just signed up for a session uh, and I played some music for her uh, and then we started talking and she wanted to talk about what is the soul uh, and I, I was like oh okay we're going there great let's let's go there and um, we in just that like five minutes that we were talking we decided you know the soul uh, if it exists is collective right mm -hmm. uh, and and more specifically it's hard to get deeper without it's hard to get deeper by yourself. Hmm. It's hard to get a, a sense of yourself by yourself and, 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 and a sense of a real depth of feeling by yourself. Um, and so even when we were doing that one-on-one, -on -one, this was through Zoom, of course, uh, through an online platform, um, we, we, we were acknowledging that we weren't getting there. Mm -hmm. uh, we were doing our best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And the platform was designed to really make it as close to that experience as we possibly can, but it's still not enough. That's me. interesting. I because I can totally that definitely connects with me personally. If I think about all of the most emotionally impactful experiences of my life, how many of them occurred when I was by myself? <laughs> They're pretty much zero. Um, I don't know. Yeah, unless I'm... you unless you go unless you go on a solo hike to Machu Machu Picchu and like uh, decide to to do your sort of shamanistic like right uh, spiritual evolution right then then, then sure yeah uh, but and, and, and there are there are moments like that where if if you're contemplating nature or or even if you're having a like kind of a meditative or religious experience that can be kind of more individual but I would say even then even then you're more likely to experience deep meaning in concert with other people. And, and now that you're mentioning that, I'm thinking like when you're, when you're trying to experience something deep by yourself, you're doing it by interacting with the natural world. You're not alone. You are, you are, you, you do it by, by realizing and noticing and being mindful of, your surroundings and of the things around you, of the living things around you, right? Um, of beauty, of color. Um, these are not things that are inner, right? Right. So even when you're even when you're experiencing something individually, it's you're not alone. You're not, and that that's cool. I like that. That's really <clears> interesting. <throat> and but it's also interesting contrasting that kind of what we before the uh, before we started recording, we talked about this a little bit, and that is that. Contrasting that idea of um, of communality being this extreme, extremely important aspect of obviously connecting emotionally. At the same time, for us specifically as musicians, I think right now is kind of a crisis because a lot of what we do is, as you s I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but um, a lot of you what did. we do is find is basically very connected to our expression as individuals and therefore we we kind of experience a lot of meaning in expressing ourselves as individuals and there thereby basically somehow getting some validation from the audience or getting um getting affirmation back right and um so I, i've str i've thought about this and i've struggled with this because 
it's true that musicians seek validation, but I also really, the, the word trivializes, I think, the, the, the actual thing that we seek and the actual um, thing that we value in performing, and that is feeling valued. Um, uh, not necessarily feeling validated for our actions. Um, like, does that make sense? I, th yeah. I think it's an important distinction sure. that, 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 um, that having put in a lot of work and then performing and then someone going, that sounded good mm -hmm. is not what is not why we do what we do. Uh, that's validation. Right. That's, that's, that's putting in the work, doing a thing and then get receiving praise. Yeah. Um, uh, you can do that in anything that you're good at. Uh, <laughs> you can, yeah. you can, you can do that in cooking. You can do that, uh, in coding. You can do that in, uh, uh in, in a, uh, as an office boy, you know, you can get, you can get validation there. Um, there's a sense of immense value that I feel from people that I perform for because of that depth of feeling that we were just talking about. Right. Um, and I think, I think the depth of feeling is the product, but the byproduct of that is a sense of value. Um, right. And I think that sense of value is something that um, I... While I've been working toward the depth of feeling, that sense of value is not something that I have felt really, Interesting. Uh, and or and or and or been able to build with people mm -hmm. um, since mid March. Mm -hmm. So I think that is a really important distinction between because obviously and in a way I think it's something that's really. Um, highlighted by the nature of social media itself because social media is really good at at tracking validation right it's like social media is designed to provide you with sort of these arbitrary bits and these likes and these little fragmented pieces of keyword uh, arbitrary right? <laughs> yes and you know it, it I think it strikes us, it, it, it um, attaches to our emotions because we, um, you know, there's some um, emotional impact we get from seeing something on a screen uh, from a third party, like a website that's, uh, or an app that's somehow, oh, someone across the country liked this or whatever, right? So we, we experience this validation from social media. However, it, and it's arbitrary, it's easy, it's, you know, one like from someone when you, so when you are talking about musical value, right? That experience that someone has, that emotive experience someone has in a concert, no individual is alike. You, there's no like, like <laughs> from your deep experience watching a, a symphony orchestra concert or a rock concert. It's this individual experience. So I can see how, and I agree that the experience of performing has totally changed because maybe that ability to actually truly emotionally connect with the audience is gone. So is that kind of what you're talking about with the Hidden uh, Fabric Music Project where you felt like it almost wasn't enough? Yes. Um, so uh, this, this project um, is really... Um, Sa Sam Weiser, a violinist in the Del Sol String Quartet, uh, in tip. Shout Shipsco out to Sam Weiser. Got, shout out to Sam Weiser. Uh, <laughs> and I got together and we were like, we want to do something. Like, we hate playing online for people. Uh, we don't want to do that. Let's do something. Let's make something happen. And so we were like talking. We threw out a bunch of ideas to each other. Didn't really get anywhere. Uh, Cynthia Sun, his girlfriend, uh, was like, I have this idea, um, which is one on one, ex like, I hate the word experiences because I'm, I'm, then I'm just like, 
I'm from a tech company. Uh, I work for Airbnb. Yeah. We sell experiences. <laughs> but um, which is why we called them one-on-ones, uh, which is basically you, me, on a call, 15 minutes. Um, I play something. Uh, and then we talk about it. That's it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and anyone can sign up. It's free. Um, and donation based, so free. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we have a super roster of musicians. Like, and one one thing that was important to to us was that we asked people that we felt would be good at this, mm-hmm. <laughs> but also are some of the best musicians that we know, and sure. and uh, from from all over the country. So the, the, these are the people that we asked, and um, we had such a great amount of people say yes, and then we rolled it out and we 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 did a lot of planning with like this is how we want to roll it out this is what we want to do we rolled it out and we had a couple people sign up and we started doing it and then it sort of fizzled and we started reaching out to um uh old age homes and we started reaching out to uh after school programs um and and uh, very few were interested in making it work because there was, it just seemed like more work for them, right? Right. Uh, to be able to, 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 um, to mediate between us and either parents who would have to set up those calls for their kids mm-hmm. or older people in old age homes who would not know what to do. Um, right. And, more than that, um, I think it became clear that as the pandemic uh, unfurled, um, right around the time we hit that lull where we were where we were uh, reaching out to these organizations was when Black Lives Matter was like happening. Was when George Floyd was killed, and we turned to each other and we were like, oh, we can't do this right now. Like, and then we looked at our roster and we looked at the people we were reaching out to and we did not have a person of color on our roster. It didn't, it didn't occur to us to diversify our roster purposefully. We just asked people that we knew but because of the way we've been brought up, because of the schools we went to, because of um, the system that we live in, we asked white and Asian people. And we were thinking specifically about having a good mix of genders and, and, and sexual orientations, but we, didn't, we weren't thinking about race. And I think that was, that's very telling. And, I, and we felt really, we, we, and we got together after that, and we're like, do we, do we from here? Do we do we do we start over? Uh, and we're still in the process of thinking about that. We're still mm-hmm. in the process of, of talking about like what? How are we going to make this matter? How are we going to make this reflect what is happening? And that's difficult because as we've seen through this pandemic, every week is a different world. Um, and so it's hard to. It's so difficult. It takes it takes constant vigilance to. Um, create something like this uh, in the midst of a global pandemic and, and specifically right now. Uh, so that, that's where we're at. That's really fascinating. And I mean, I think, yeah, obviously as an artist today and right now, I've, I think in some lo- to some degree, I've talked with this about every guest or with every guest because it's it's the question of the day is how do we as musicians classical musicians live in 2020 because we can't live we we can't basically can't (laughs) do it like they did it in the 40s right if we look at a recital footage from the 40s versus today it looks very similar um which isn't necessarily bad in itself but if we as, a, as an art form haven't 
adapted to where we are today and what is going on today, then I think we're kind of missing the point. And and uh, I think that's really interesting. I was I was um, part of a panel on classical revolution um, on their live stream with um, it was moderated mm. by Cherith and Tito Munoz and some awesome conductors and and musicians and they were talking about uh, representation in in music and and I thought it was interesting because separately people brought up the problems of the Western canon being absolutely established obviously and um, hard it being harder for new composers and new music to enter into the canon and then separately also talking about how it's hard for uh, people of color to enter into this space and to me I, I thought well those two things are absolutely connected right um, mm -hmm. it's it's funny as like you know playing playing in quartet san francisco is kind of funny because we play i don't I, like a very even <laughs> we play very even representation of of composers from all different cultures and backgrounds because we don't play classical music <laughs> right so it, it struck me as interesting that they're the same problem what do you think about that I, I, it's, I agree with everything that you just said. Um, <laughs> so it comes down to what we define as classical music, right? Um, and and also what... Oh, man, how do we fix the classical music world? <laughs> um, well, we're going we're gonna to do it right here today on the podcast, so okay? <laughs> sounds great. Okay. Um, I I can only speak of my own experiences. I'm I with when it, when it comes to the subject, I'm yeah. I'm gonna go about it this way. So, um, my dad's a jazz pianist. Uh, my mom's an opera singer, and uh, I grew up around that, but n neither of them told me to go into music, right? Like, that was very much my own volition. I'm, I'm the first string player in my family. Um, they're the only two musicians in our extended, extended family. Um, and um, I went to school through undergrad and into my first year of uh, post undergrad, so my one year program at, at the San Francisco Conservatory where we met that year. Um, and through that year even, um, I held a firm belief that the orchestra as we know it is, in, is, um, is an industrial age machine that is antiquated and unnecessary. Full stop. I did not want to play in an orchestra. Who wants to play in an orchestra? Literally no one who goes to music school wants to play in an orchestra, except for the chosen few who sort of zero in on it and say, this is how I'm going to make money as a musician. And then everyone else sort of gets there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I got that, there, certainly. That's fair. By, that's it, just it's, fair. It's true. And you, and you <laughs> talk to... And you talk to um, people in, in the LA Phil, you talk to people in the New York Philharmonic, uh, you talk to people in the Berlin Phil, and they're doing it because they love it, but they love it also for the money. <laughs> it pays very well to be an orchestral musician in comparison to being another kind of musician. Um, and... I still believe that. I still believe that if we could abandon our idea of what classical music is and start from the ground up, I think the world would be a better place. 
but that's going to be so hard. <laughs> and, um, and, and there's a lot of facets to that, right? I, I, I think I'm, I'm also speaking very US centric, right? Um, I, I think uh, that there are a lot of European countries who, uh, in which this, that change is both harder and would be both harder and easier. Like it's ingrained in their culture, uh, but it's also government funded. And so if the government wanted it to be a certain way, it would be. Whereas here and in a couple other countries, um, it's funded by people who want to hear very specific music. Yeah. Uh, and those people are often white and rich. Mm -hmm. And so then that comes down to who do we get to pay for classical music? Who wants to hear it? More often than not, it's upper middle class, upper class people. Mm -hmm. um, and because of the systemic injustices in our country, most often those people are white. And most often those people grow up with the idea that classical music has a subconscious idea. This isn't, um, but a subconscious idea that classical music is in a way superior to other musics, right? And we, and we believe that on some level. I think all of us believe that on some level. Um, should we? Probably not. But it's part of the reason what we, <laughs> we do what we do. Um, it's a complicated thing. Yeah. I think, um, I think, I mean, from my own point of view, it's like, you know, looking at this, um, looking at our, our, our uh, landscape, looking at taking us to individuals, for example, two white dudes. <laughs> um, Look at th us. There's... Um, we, we can't do anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I mean, uh, I, I use us as an example that we yeah, independently... Yeah, yeah we independently came to classical music and that it's not a coincidence, right? We, we were drawn to it for whatever reasons and our background helped us get here, right? Um, that, that much is undeniable. And I think there's, I think there's going to, going to have to be several different, um, Rec not rectifications. There's going to have be have several reckonings that have to happen. Um, maybe, maybe not reconciliations, but but let's just say historically, you know. Do we condemn Beethoven for being white and for being in his no. culture and his time? No, no one I don't wants think that. so. Yeah, <laughs> be, no, no I mean, one be, wants that. Yeah, and <laughs> be, well, of course not, because he has a. He has a, um, he, a a place in time, mm -hmm. a, a place in geography and history, right? And part of what we do as classical musicians is upholding, or not upholding, but but playing, specializing in repertoire from this time and place, right? Mm -hmm. I think what has to happen for the continued the viability of our art form is learn how to integrate new composers and thereby new points of view, new experiences, which obviously it's funny. I mean, just even from starting this podcast, it's really interesting because when you learn how, when you're online looking at, okay, how do I get my podcast out there? How do I get the word out? How do I do this? One of the key things that is always the advice is like, pick your niche, find your niche, you know? So I think one of the things that's happened in classical music is that its niche has been the same thing for a really long time and it hasn't changed. Yeah. And, that's, and that marketing has worked for a specific section of the population. It's worked for a specific sector that continues to financially support it. So then classical music feels like it can't change because it doesn't want to lose its niche, right? Yes. And, and, um, oh, sorry. and what you were saying about in Europe, there's more sort of government support for the arts. It is nice when you do have some independence from the economic um, 
<laughs> realities of appealing to a certain class, appealing to a certain donors. Um, I think that definitely is part of what needs to happen for composers and musicians to f have that freedom to try something new and make ex and you know sort of go in new directions. So um, anyway, I I think that was my reflection. I think it's helpful for um, us to in investigate that possibility. Obviously, I think government support doesn't solve all problems, but in nope. some senses, it can definitely take some ease off. It can take some pressure off of organizations to appeal on a purely um, on a purely monetary basis to the same group of support that it's had forever. And doubling back to what we were talking about just briefly before about uh, audiences, right? Uh, who's listening to classical music? Who wants to listen to classical music? Um, I think the most important factor here is believing that what we, the classical music that we play, um, by as long as it's good, <laughs> we don't necessarily have to play uh, Beethoven and Brahms over and over again. Um, but uh, good music by by um, composers of uh, uh, all races and and um, uh, all sexual orientations, all nationalities. Um, and bringing that music to schools in every single place, mm -hmm. period. Um, and um, the education systems in our country, the music education systems in our country, um, keeping those alive and important uh, is, I think, the number one priority um, because if you don't listen to or know about classical music as a kid then you're not going to listen to it when you get older mm -hmm. it's very very unlikely <laughs> um, you 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 grow up listening to a certain thing you know it's true um, and and I yeah that's and and I'm I'm so happy that that um, I I went to a public school district that had a public school music program and because mm -hmm. uh, without that I would not be doing what I'm doing. Right. I yeah that's that's key because we we in some sense I think you had your public school district I was in a um, I was actually homeschooled but I did in my area have access to classical music through my youth symphony and stuff so. So yeah. those, those um, programs, programs are These unbelievably programs. essential. Um, I, I did want to, I did have a reflection though about sort of on the other side, right? There's the education side, which is undeniably needed. But on the mm. other side, and I, <laughs> I feel like a total boomer talking about this because I, I'm not uh, qualified to talk about this, but social media, okay? How do we use social media? to spread classical music. No, but um, here's, here's what I'm gonna say about it, is that one thing I've been doing recently is I've been following um, a lot more guitarists, for example, on Instagram. I think they do a, a really better job than classical musicians. <laughs> because you have all these amazing um, guitarists like Tosin Abasi and Matteo Sassato and all these guys who are like basically composing and they're, they're working there it's a very lively composer scene where they're taking something someone else is doing and oh, like and they're going cross genre oh robert glasper what is he doing on keys what if i do kind of a lick like this like so there there there's like these pockets of neo soul neo hip hop that are coming up in different instruments in different ways and compositions kind of being based on these different styles and it's it's this hotbed of of kind of creativity that um, guitarists are really engaging in on on social media. So we were kind of bagging on it before because that lack of authenticity, the lack of personal connection. But I think on the other hand, um, if classical musicians are somehow able to um, get over this legacy art form style of just continuing to play the same stuff over and over again and actually kind of interacting with the world of music as it's developing what are people listening to 
you know what are what are genres what are what are different stuff i think you know as as we go genres are are breaking down right if classical musicians don't reflect the fact that genres are breaking down that that musicians from every um walk of life can collaborate with each other and make each other sound better you know i think the more we wall ourselves off with this attitude that classical musician classical music is superior right the, the longer we do that the less we're going to develop the more we're going to diminish yes 100 percent. i'm i have nothing more to add to that. <laughs> that's that's it yeah <laughs> so anyway i mean I, i'm uh i am the first to uh i'm the first musician to take that criticism as someone who who, who posts a very very infrequently and very uh, uh of dubious uh of dubious uh, consistency but i think that that is an important thing for us going forward as musicians yeah i i also don't post that much in general because um i i'm very um self-conscious but also self-aware about what i put online uh this is something um i if i don't think it's good and i i like this is the reason why i don't post practice logs like um and this is totally a personal thing um but i don't I don't want people to see my process. Mm. Like, <laughs> I I don't need that that motivation. Mm -hmm. Certainly, to to in order to, in order to work like that, that's something that I I I feel like I, I'm I can do by myself. Um, I'm I'm fairly self motivated. Right. Um, but, I, I also just like. For all the people that, are going to look at my practice log online that I put on and think, oh, cool, maybe I should try that. There's gonna be a couple people who I might care about their opinions, who will be like, oh, oh, <laughs> I don't want that. You know, I just, I, it, it, it matters a lot to me, the, 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 the product that exists of me out there. I, I like it heavily curated. Yeah, I mean, obviously so, I, as, as an artist, as an artist, you, that's like one of the um, things you have every right to sort of um, have every right to manage and curate. I think for myself, I've been, I've been looking at it from two different ways. And um, I mean, maybe just one different way. And that is that um, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe I am more motivated um, by um, getting things out there. I'm a little more, I have a little more fire under my ass if I'm going to actually um, share it with people. But also, um, I think sometimes I, especially now, can get a little abstracted when I'm practicing and I can engage in exercises and things. And if, if it gets too far away from what's performable, mm -hmm. then I'm missing something like I, I think I I can get kind of very like, oh, I'm just going to practice these hand positions and stuff that I'm interested in. And and yet somehow it's not referring to what it's actually going to sound like when I perform it. So I think that is one useful thing for me about posting more frequently on Instagram mm. um, because it it keeps me really focused on like okay yeah. what, is this performable what i'm doing right now otherwise why am i practicing it kind of right and i mean but and there's also for me that's like at a certain point um that playing is me so even as imperfect as it is and mistakes and a little out of tune and whatever it is it's like well for for me personally it's like at a certain point i'm i have to enter into who and what i am as a musician and either i I mean, I mean, you, you, again, you're, you, we're, there's no oh, right no, or I wrong. Think, there's no, no right that, or wrong. Yeah, but I also, as you're saying this, I'm like, wow, that's a healthy mindset. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm on the same boat. I've, I, I'm only very recently, I think probably because of this pandemic, I've become more, um, I've, I have more of a sense of urgency. Like, if I'm a musician, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get out there. I've got to, 
I've got to perform. And which you've done great things with, with group muse and stuff, which I'd love to ask about frequently or, or, or in, a, in a second. But, but yeah, with sure. social media, um, I definitely found myself over having to overcome a barrier of, oh, man, what if some what if some buddy who I want a job from in the future sees this and is like, oh, that was out of tune. Never, never going to hire ooh, that guy. You know? Oh, that's out of tune. Ooh, ooh. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, that's scary. It's scary oh, to boy. think about. But but it's also for me, it's like, well, if I'm practicing and it sounds like that, then that's exactly where I am right now. And I shouldn't, you know, it's like I, I don't want there to be that disconnect. I want who I am on stage to be who I am in the practice room. So anyway, that's neither here nor there. That's great. Um, but yeah, so, so you've, you've done some, some group muse things, right? I have. Um, L loved your, your George Crumb. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. What have you um, been doing performance wise? Um, San Jose Chamber Orchestra has been keeping us a little bit busy with, uh, recording projects from the house, um, that they've been doing with their youth orchestra, which has been super cool. And I'm super grateful to Barbara Day Turner and, and that organization so much. Um, and, uh, I've been doing a couple of other self recording projects. Um, I've been applying to a couple competitions that are online. Um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I forgot the deadline for one a couple days ago. That was very embarrassing. <laughs> um, so, oh well. Oh well. Uh, but uh, it was just a that I was using for, for a different competition anyway. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my friend Alyssa Wang. Um, shout out. Team, shout out to Alyssa Wang. Um, violinist and conductor. Uh, lives in Boston. Uh, was back in, I think still is actually back in the Bay Area. She's from Danville. Um, and I went uh, and uh, did a little socially distanced duo concert with her at, uh, out like on the end of her cul-de-sac for all of her neighbors who were like 50 feet away from us. Uh, and that was the first live concert I've done in ages. Mm. Uh, and that was awesome. That was really <laughs> great. Just to, just to play like dinky Baccarini duo and uh, meditation from Thais uh, with her was just and she played a uh, this Viotti sonata uh, that she learned in a day <laughs> it was not so I was just playing continuo going this is great <laughs> I could do this all day uh, one five one five yeah 100 yep. mm -hmm. um, it was a it was actually a very funny piece I think you'd like it a lot oh yeah um, gotta check it out um, and some teaching here and there, um, and just a lot of, you know, practice, practice. Wonderful. Um, I think we, I mean, we've already covered a lot of ground. I don't need to take up too much more of your time. I just did want to cover, okay. um, um, just some, something we discussed a little bit before. And that is that I thought it was interesting. Um, I always like to ask people about kind of their, um, their teachers or their their upbringing yeah. and maybe how they also um, t bring that to their teaching. And yeah. um, I think since we, we played in a string quartet for many years, yeah. two, two years, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's a long time. It's not long, t long enough. Um, yeah. but, but you said something one time that, that, I, that struck me a lot. And it actually, I... Um, it made sense to me because when we rehearsed together, I, it always struck me how um, it's almost your, it almost felt like you listened to the group from outside or something. You're very able to approach a piece from this very holistic sound point of view. Whereas, and, and I think it helped me a lot, to be honest. Um, it helped me develop my sense of ensemble playing just the way you're able to, to ooh, we got, I, we got a bassoonist over there? We have a bassoon in here. <laughs> well, that's great. I might move outside for a moment. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'll give you time here. Just keep going. Oh, oh yeah, so. Just keep, keep, keep talking. <clears throat> I did want to ask you about something you said early on, which was kind of like in your undergrad, you said, 
almost more than almost more than technique you worked on your ear you worked on listening something like that right yeah so could you mm -hmm. explain kind of that is true that, that um, idea so um I I don't know if it was entirely conscious, the work, um, but I think my teacher was very conscious about me going through that work. Um, my, my teacher in undergraduate, David Primo, um, is an associate principal fellow at the Pittsburgh Symphony, um, and he was, uh, he tapped in right away that I was a very pessimistic person. <laughs> and very hard on myself. Uh, I'm, I'm still my own worst critic, for sure. Um, and uh, he uh, was always just very supportive, and, and uh, but was also always giving me a bunch of repertoire to work on at once. I would always be working on five different things at a time. And um, I think in doing that, he um, helped me listen to a lot of different kinds of music at once and and in playing with a lot of different people all the time he helped me sort of get used to um yeah just listening intently you know mm -hmm. 